Welcome back to episode 87 of the Sports Medicine Project. Hope you're all doing well, of course. You would be, hopefully, you're turning on this podcast, ready to learn, ready to hear something different because our guest today is not from Australia. He is all the way on the other side of the world in Chicago, Dr. George Talala, who is a medical doctor, PhD, orthopedist, and... Now, they say orthopedist instead of orthopedic. In America, they do. Yeah. Like physical therapist instead of physical yeah. therapist. Yeah, well, orthopedic surgeon, doctor. He, he talks about on, on the episode how the amount of training that they need. talks about lots of good things, but a very elevated pitch of his bio. He's a sports medicine surgeon and scientist at Midwest Orthopedics at Rush University Hospital. Now, which is, this is just awesome. He's a team physician for the Chicago Bulls and Chicago White Sox, which is just, that's cool. Like, that they're the biggest cool. teams in the world. Yeah, I'm very excited to listen to this episode. Unfortunately, I wasn't present for the recording of this episode, but I am. <laughs> yeah. Why are you laughing? So get this, listeners. So we've 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 locked in. We're doing it really late at night because of the time difference over in Chicago. He is predominantly hip, knee, and shoulder surgery. And I lined up some questions. I wanted to ask him about some foot and ankle stuff, but not so much. But I definitely wanted to get his opinion on the syndesmosis surgery. And a couple of hours or so before the podcast was meant to start, he hits me with an email back and goes, oh, I don't do too much with foot and ankle. Like I'm proficient and I understand it quite well. But, you know, we have orthopedic surgeons that look after that. So Kelly then hits me and goes, I don't think I'm going to be able to stay awake, so you're on your own. So I'm like, great, I'm going to have to talk about knees and hips, which I know a little bit about. but that was coming when you said... Well, I thought I was going to ask... (laughs) Yeah, I know. I kind of just thought a little bit, but I'd also had prepared, but I was like, oh, well, we can kind of bounce around and talk about everything. But uh, I think the problem was because my follow-up questions were... Just, I just didn't understand the nuances of it. So the, the reply or the answer, like, oh, okay. But if it was in the foot and the ankle, I'd be like, oh, well, then what about if, if this happens, what would you do or, or what would you say? But that's sure okay. you did fine. <laughs> yep, so you do knee surgery? Yep. Cool, and then I just ended it there. <laughs> yeah. Hey, if you, can, if you can record a podcast on your own about the pelvic floor, I think you can record one about the knee and the hip. Yeah, Surely you know true. that more than the pelvic floor. Yeah, yeah. And that was a good one. Yeah, I never thought when I very first started as a podiatrist that I would be talking about pelvic floor health with somebody online and going out to thousands of, of people. But it was it was good. I feel as though I get... Like, I really enjoy learning about this kind of stuff. Mm. Ethan and I will never implement it, but... There's these times where, and it doesn't happen all the time, but I'm speaking with someone in the clinic and they will mention something about pelvic floor physio and they'll mention something about ACL surgery or hip surgery. And because of all the guests we've talked to and all the people I get to to talk to in the meetings and webinars and things I get to go to, plus getting to speak to you about it, I have an understanding. I don't really talk much about it, but I'm like, oh yeah, I know exactly what you mean. This is what you mean. They're like, oh yeah. yeah I didn't podcasts really... in general, I think podcasts mm. is such a great platform for us to, to learn. It's so easy to put some headphones in, continue doing your cleaning, your driving, whatever it might be, and just soak in all of the, the knowledge. I just, I think it's such a cool platform. Do you yeah. know, I remember when it was the early stage of our relationship and you used to give me shit for listening to true crime podcasts. You were like, you listen to podcasts? You're so weird, blah, blah, blah. Why now, was this? No, I don't know. Podcast oh, I think maybe <laughs> the fact that it was was true crime. That was back when I was like, it's this way or the highway. I didn't understand that mm. uh, everyone can be a little bit different. But uh, I think it would have been because it was true crime because we tried to listen no, to it I one day, I think. <laughs> Just podcasts in general. I thought I've been listening to them for a while. Brad Beer was the first pod- podcast I ever listened to mm. in the health space. I was even before that. I feel like I was one of the first people to get into the podcast. Yeah. Well, it, it's been good. I, another positive from it is we've had so many people. We went to the, the footy yesterday and I was speaking to another pod. Hopefully he's listened to this. His name's Luke. And yeah, really great bloke. Awesome bloke. And he was like, yeah, I listened to a couple of episodes here and there. Like it was related to... To the field of podiatry, like the hypermobility ones, some tendon ones, and bone ones. And I was like, that's really cool. It's mm. it's great, and you just you you just learn a lot from doing them, which is awesome and good. I want to go back through, and I hope this on another podcast. I think I've spoken to you about this. If I could, 
go through every single episode and summarize the key point and then put that into a book, like that would be really cool. Maybe an e-book, maybe not a paperback book, but I was listening to another podcast of a guy that was doing that, but his podcast has got like millions of views, so maybe it's a bit different, but that would be cool. I also have a cool thing to, to say in relation to the podcast. I yeah, you I just say it. That I had a student with me recently, an exercise physiology student, and yep. she had a, a clinical interest in hypermobility and... I had her present to the clinic on a hypermobility case that we saw together. And then I was telling her about our podcast that we just recorded with Taylor. So she listened to that podcast and then she had to do a case presentation for the uni Mm. and incorporated stuff from the podcast plus the case presentation that I got her to do to the clinic. Mm. And the supervisor that she presented it to asked her if she would like to do her PhD on the topic. Wow. From that. That's incredible. That's so cool. Yeah, that's awesome. So proud of you. That's, that's really awesome. good. Mm. Yeah. Really now, good. great things to come from. Yeah. Now you've got a story for our listeners. I've got a now story. Now you give story. full consent. You've signed all the documents. You're allowed to speak about it openly. Yeah. Tell the to listeners what's happened. Well, the sad news. I guess it's a, a sad news, but I was also going to say it's also been my high for the week in some ways as well. Is that I have a femoral shaft. Well, pretty much just whole femoral, to be honest. Yeah. Bone stress yeah. injury. So extending from my neck of femur all the way down to my distal femur. Uh, it was a 38 centimeter distribution of swelling within the bone. So I'm off running. The sports doctor thinks it might be a stress fracture, but I had a CT scan and that didn't think so, but he still thinks it could be. Um, either way, it's six weeks off running for me. I also had blood tests done just to rule out any hormonal disruption or um, deficiencies that could be influencing it. And I was surprised to actually see that that was all normal and clear, mm. which is all positive. Um, Blake and I, we, we laughed about it afterwards because we were like, oh, does that mean that this is actually just from, from running? That there, maybe there isn't anything else that, well, that I'm sure there's plenty of other things that are um, factoring into to this injury itself. But yeah, I was surprised to see that that was all all normal with the area that's been injured. Um, so yeah, I'm on the low impact, no impact train for the next six weeks, and then mm. gradual return to running from there. Yeah, that MRI was it was very interesting to see how much bony edema you had. So you had the MRI, and then we were looking at it in real time without the report. And we look at MRIs all the time, but certainly have no more expertise than you know the, the people that look at them all the time. And there was so much white fluid down through that femur, we thought that it was so consistent. We're like, oh, that's normal. That's normal. That's yeah, just like normal you can't have a stress reaction extend that far. Yeah, all the way. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, and there was this like focal point kind of about one third Mid-shaft, down. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but Which I had- where I was symptomatic. So two weeks ago, I ran a PB at Park Run and then afterwards, I started to get some mid-thigh pain and there's probably not too many other things as a distance runner that you'd probably have around that Yeah, what, that what area. would you... If someone come in, like, what differential oh, could it be? I mean, you can't say a, a quad strain and what else would there... I mean, it could obviously could yeah, be, quad but... quad strain. So, I actually mm. had a patient, the, the like, that week who was a distance runner training for the Sydney Marathon with the exact same presentation, mid-thigh pain, and I was like, oh, I think we have to rule this out as being a bony injury. Mm. So I sent him for an MRI, and he had a quad strain. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. wow, that's really lucky. Do you typically <laughs> see them, is it, because what, like where the, the mid-thigh, it's not muscle, or t- is it muscle to tendon? Does it, how hard, how hard does it come up it was, from the knee before it turns into tendon? The, the patient that I saw, it was the intramuscular like fascia or something like that fascia mm-hmm. tear and that correlated to the side of pain yeah it wasn't just internal yeah, yeah. and no yeah. no sudden onset for this person it was gradual as well so it was quite weird did you have any after that park run so two things to talk about that i wanted to get your your thoughts on actually three of there's probably four or five but one when you originally had the pain after the saturday we were joking around saying, yeah, you, you've got a femoral stress, you let's rule it out. And we did the full pump test. Well, yeah. I did it and perhaps I didn't do it right. But you didn't have any pain on that, did you? But you, you had pain hopping straight I had away. pain hopping, yeah. No, yeah. didn't have any pain on the full pump test. I had Joe reassess me early that week in the clinic and he did a full pump test on me as well. And I, I don't know if it's because I was anticipating it and I was guarding because mm. 
that I, I did have pain with the fulcrum test from either of you, mm. but I did have pain sitting on the stools in our house when my leg was just was hanging, hanging off, off the edge. Yeah. Yep. And I had pain even just sitting at work when my leg was hanging off the edge. So mm. when I was completely passive and relaxed, I could feel that area. But when someone was testing it with the fulcrum test, I think I was so like guarded and probably just locked on with my quads that I wasn't actually letting you yeah. do it properly. Um, yeah. which is common like you see that all the time with sort of special tests that you can't accurately assess someone because there is a lot of guarding going on because it's painful or you're apprehensive to, to let someone nudge into that point of pain yeah kelly just put special tests in air uh, quotation i think you forgot that it's a podcast and people can't see you <laughs> i thought that my tone changed enough that people would catch on <laughs> and special test and then it's <laughs> like down yeah, like oh yeah she's been sarcastic the so, other interesting thing about my mm. leg that i think is worth noting is that oh, you ask, yeah the next day oh that's what i was gonna say yeah, yeah. i was gonna say that's what you say so we were joking about it being a um femoral bone stress injury and deep down I was like shit do I actually have a femoral bone stress injury mm. but we had city to surf to and you were speaking day. you were speaking about it like every every couple of hours you're like it's still sore it's still sore yeah. yeah the next morning woke up and we were down in Sydney about to do city to surf and I was like should I run should I not run and we're turning into a long we run, so we're going to do a, a 30k long run. And so I was like, oh, I'll just see how it goes for a couple of kilometers. <laughs> it was the most vague report. She's like, oh, I'll just see how it goes if it warms up. It I, was thought... either, I was like, I'll either do it all or I'll do nothing. So I was like, okay, if it warms up, great. So we went for, I think we ran 11 kilometers before City to Surf and it yeah. warmed up completely. Yeah. Had no pain whatsoever for all of City to Surf either. Yeah. And then we ran a few kilometers after it's 28 kilometer run. No and we cooled, we cooled down whatsoever. between when we finished, we probably cooled down for five minutes or maybe even 10 minutes and then started running some more. Yeah. So I just, I, I imagine if someone come into the clinic on Monday and you were asking around their, their pain history, and let's say, you know, your case as an example, did a really fast park run, you did increase your running as well and your intensity and you had this mid thigh pain. And then on Sunday you went into this massive run. And you just just surf relatively quick than what you would do for a normal run and it warmed up. And I'm thinking, I don't know, because I don't see that, would you be less suspicious of a bone injury if that was happening in the clinic? And I'm trying to think for the whole lower limb, even for the shins or the metatarsals, like if someone come in and they had vague midfoot pain, like, oh yeah, I ran 30Ks and it warmed up, I'd be like, that would probably make me less suspicious of a bone injury. I I agree until now. (laughs) Yeah. 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 So it's been an interesting learning curve i think in how how the the bone can respond to to load yeah i would have been so interested to see what the mri and the ct look like on the saturday before that run i wonder how much different it would have been because you had a lot of like anterior thickening and antiquening sorry antiquening anterior fluid down your femur as well when you look at it from is that the coronal view when you look down yeah so the periosteum was all lit up yeah and also the bone marrow was all very white Mm. also yeah it was interesting one of the analogies i heard about stress reactions and bone injuries was saying if you you imagine you've got a a piece of harder plastic aluminium aluminium that's it a piece of aluminium maybe can you explain it because i I think i'm gonna this is how neil explained it to me he said so imagine you've got a, a big thick piece of aluminium and you bend it once and it's okay and then you bend it again and it, you keep bending it, keep bending it, and it starts to become a little bit weaker at that bending point until eventually it, it breaks and that's mm. a, essentially a, a fracture. And so he likened that to the, the process of a, a bone stress injury and, yeah. a, and a, a stress fracture. And I thought it was yeah, a really good analogy to explain yeah. it because it makes... It, I mean, I guess like when I have previously explained bone stress injuries to people in the past, I've try to explain them is then their their bone turnover is not keeping up with the demand which is almost a little bit maybe too scientific for some people mm, whereas yeah, yeah that analogy i think is a really good representation of of what sort of happens and a nice way to sort of understand mm, i do like the bone turnover one yeah. like it, i think it makes sense of you know you're just building something up and there's new stuff getting laid down i mean there's also there's ways that you can explain bone yeah. stress injuries to people and i think the having the combination of that sort of more scientific explanation in combination with something that you can picture is, is good to help people get it. Yeah. 
Yeah. So you're so you're gonna have six weeks off now. Two weeks down already. Two weeks down. Go. When when is it safe to load? Not running, but mm-hmm. when is it safe to load the femur in the gym? Well, I've actually programmed myself some squats for this week. I haven't done any like quad loading mm. for the last two weeks, but I'm now walking pain. Well, you have. I mean, you've been on the Swift. That's quite oh, yeah. Um, yeah, but not yeah. not heavier loading. And I'm not going to go heavy with my squats or anything like that. You're just going to tone. I'm just going to... Yeah, just, <laughs> just tone up. Just um, low weight high reps. <laughs> yeah. Sculpt. Um, that's it. Sculpt. I think, I think I'm just going to see, like work around symptoms at this mm. point in time. So... I will just do a little bit of uh, resistance-based training. I've started loading my calf raises now to try and maintain some calf capacity because I was on fire with that yeah. until this. So I yeah. want to really try and keep that going. Um, but my goal isn't necessarily to, to get strong with squats or deadlifts or any of that big axial load type stuff. It's probably more just to keep my body moving and to try and maintain just a little mm. bit of muscle mass, probably like minimal effective dose is what I've got in mind for, yep. for that. Yeah. Yeah. Now no repeat MRI because it's very likely that the bone will look pretty similar, mm-hmm. but repeat x-ray around six weeks. X-ray to just see that the if there's any callus or thickening. Yeah. Yep. Thickening to show signs that it's healing or healed. Yeah, I, I did a post this week talking about people having access to imaging. So you had your MRI within four three days, days four days of the image. Yeah. But then when we thought of it, because we we're pretty pretty confident anyway, but when we thought of it, we had it probably within 24 hours. Mm-hmm. And, you know, people were messaging through saying, you know, they're waiting months and, and weeks. And I'm just thinking how much that would change how good you would have to be clinically. I mean, mm. a lot of the time, yes, you can get a pretty good idea just from your clinical tests and history, but there's always a part of you that's like, oh, I just need to confirm. And like you said, that, that quad strain, you know, you're suspicious of a, of a femoral yeah. BSI. I imagine in the tibia or a metatarsals, it, it does, it dramatically changes the treatment. Like one is sure. six weeks and on weight bearing. The other one is, yeah, you can push into symptoms. Yeah, yeah, 100%. And yeah. that was that was so unusual. I thought to to see that yeah. in that person. I was like, this is a very lucky MRI. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> very good outcome seeing yeah. this. So yeah, hundred percent. I think it's. I mean, it's you're you're right. Like uh, you'd think that bone stress injuries, like the the clinical suspicion, needs to be higher for any run long distance runner that you're that you're seeing. But it certainly makes it easier to know that we're able to get someone in for an MRI reasonably quickly Relatively just quick. to either rule it in or out. Yeah. yeah, I really do wish there was a, a, like a bedside test that you could do. I mean, you could do ultrasound, but that's not gonna gonna show you much. Maybe in a really severe case, but just to get an MRI and there's there's so many barriers, like certainly the cost and then the access and then sometimes getting the buy-in from people. I've never had someone not get it, but it's it can be really difficult for some people. So kudos to you if you're waiting months and weeks. You're definitely doing pretty well with your clinical skills. They'd be a lot better than probably yours or I, I would think. Yeah, Yeah. Sure. Now, before we get on to our segments, post of the week, person of the week, and what to read plus the injury of the week, I come across a study this week that I was reading, and there's plenty of these studies getting around, but the, the things that patients want to know during a consult, like when they come in to see us, I think we've spoken about this before, haven't we? I think I talked about the things that they care about the most. That was uh, a, This is a, a different study. What do I have? What are we going to do about it? How long will I have it? And what's the plan? Can I do what I want? Which I thought, you probably do answer those in the initial. Like, what do I have? Let's say we were to... We have a management plan that we do at the end of our initials. And I'm pretty sure that they're exactly they're all in those there. questions. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that the what do I have can be can be tricky because like we've talked about on here, you know, calling things load related insert structure. Yeah. But I guess if you can de threaten it by saying, you know, you've got a, cr- a cranky plantar fascia or a, an irritable ankle or something like that, it's how specific do you go? Does has it does it change? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think I've been going a bit more specific of late, actually. I but it like depends. down to the cell. No, there's macrophages well, irritated. Well, it depends on the person. I, I I can't remember if we were talking about this recently on the podcast. If it's a person who comes in who's quite sort of biomedically minded, they want to know exactly what's going on. You know mm. the, the the archetype that I'm talking about. Yeah. I will make an effort to be a little bit more specific with my diagnosis, even if I'm not completely certain. 
and I think that it just helps to make them feel like I'm more confident around what's going on, even though I'm confident that I can get them better and get mm. them moving and back to what they're going to do. I, I do think that there's a, an archetype of person who really does want that specific. Yeah. And in, if I'm getting that vibe, then I will definitely go yeah. down that track of being more specific, even if I don't feel like our clinical tests are good enough that we can be specific. Yeah, well, like you and I, like with me with my ITB and you with, with your femur, you just, when you know what is happening, you almost just, oh, okay, that's what it is. That This is what we need to do. Mm-hmm. And I don't think, I don't know how how easy it would be to to not, to have someone not think about that, like to convince someone or to show someone that it's not really that important mm-hmm. because that takes a lot of time and energy is it better focusing on that and saying, oh, yeah, we don't need to worry about it for these reasons and trying to have them experience that or, or whatnot versus trying to get through the other things that are, are really important in a treatment plan or initial consult. Mm. Now, I think those questions are good, though. I think it helps just to, to sort of wrap the session up. And mm. if, you, if you've by chance brushed over any of those or if you maybe didn't explain it, and they didn't like as as in depth as you could have then having them to sort of fill out at the end of the consult just guarantees that you've at least covered those four things that the patient really wants to know so i think it's good for for that reason as well the how long will i have it's always a tricky um, one i've talked to multiple have, that's people actually something that we don't have because some hours. people say yeah. yeah time frames are great it makes it you know, again more manageable and mm. feel more real other people like no don't, don't worry about it just say it could be this uh sorry it, we don't know how long is a piece of string but uh, some, some cases you do, which again, nothing is guaranteed, but there are some cases, especially that I see like a kind of not chronic, but not acute, kind of in the middle, plenty of heel pain. And I'm like, you're doing everything right. You've got a pretty good understanding. I, I do think it's going to be probably a little bit quicker than say what the research says. That's interesting. Mm. So post of the week, meniscus repair fail rate is common. 14.8% of repairs fail within two to five years. That's not a very high percentage. Nearly one in five, not really. Now, I'm not going into the classification. I'm going to post the study in our Instagram. So if you really want to read about what the repair involved and what type of injury to the meniscus it involved, you'll have to go to the study. Higher percentage. Yeah. Hmm. Higher fail rates, older population, which was over 40. Medial meniscus repairs increase the failure rate and no ACL damage. Person of the week to follow is our incredibly knowledgeable guest, Dr. George Chala. I'll put his Instagram bio in the post that we put up. And his Instagram handle is at Chicago Sports Doc. Now, injury of the week. Tell me, have you ever seen in a pediatric patient Ostrigonum? Do you know not, well, not no, knowingly. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Instead of severs. Because it, it's yeah. not really in the same area, but it's like, oh, they... Most kids with severs, they, they just grab the back of their heel. Like, oh, yeah, this is sore. Yeah. Yeah, so do you think... Have you ever seen one? No. At all? No. I, it's, I haven't seen many either, but I had one this week where they... The, like the, the family had originally thought it was severs and it kind of fitted a, a little bit of it. It warmed up and it was sore after. And then the next day, the, the pain basically just went away. Did it get swollen? And they didn't... No, not that they could report. But again, mm. swelling, they, I think they just said it was sore. It certainly might have. But yeah, they just grabbed the back of the heel and said, yeah, this is sore, which is really typical with severs around that growth plate. Some people say it's more underneath, but generally it's more at the back. And yeah, it was interesting doing all the service testing, heel walking, all that kind of stuff and, and trying to compress and irritate that plate wasn't sore, squeezing the calc wasn't sore. But as soon as I palpated behind the Achilles and around that era, it was really sore. But I've never seen this test be so positive when I put the foot into more plantar flexion. Mm-hmm. Go a couple of degrees, couple of degrees, and then as soon as I get to almost the end range, they're like, oh yeah, that's really sore, and just pointed right at the back of the the heel, which well, is sorry, right at test. yeah, yeah. But is I've never it's supposed to be fast as well. I don't know. No, Does it make a difference? To, I guess if it's highly more irritable, you don't have to go faster. Yeah. But if they're less well, irritable, maybe why would it need to be fast then? I don't know. Does it just compress it more? I don't know. 
Yeah, let's talk about this. It could. I guess if because if you went harder, you would have more force when it gets to the end range, so it probably would go further. Yeah. Maybe. But then again, if you did it fast enough, it would be sore, especially yeah, the system in, might in be a kid. Because <laughs> it's a bit more high velocity. Yeah, I should have got the functional MRI on his brain just to see if his nervous system was lighting up. But yeah, I've never seen it so so sensitive. But it's it's pretty it's pretty tricky to treat because you can't really offload it. You can't really put them, say, for like a posterior mm. injury, you can't really put them in helios or high pitch shoot. It's generally just taping it and load modification. And they Load eye tape? Sorry? Load eye tape? Yeah, so really, it had a really flexible, maybe some degree of peripheral hypermobility, but just did some load eye to try and make the subtalar joint feel more stable and then usually do some uh, high dye ankle taping. Yeah, just to try and reduce, just to make it a little bit tighter. Mm-hmm. And other than that, it was just load modification, just some like Voltaren. But it wasn't really affecting them too much. They could still play and train. This person was playing uh, for the like the Jet, which is the the A League, but for the like the academy. But yeah, it was interesting. I haven't seen it that irritable before. I just seen. Have you? Do you see them really much at all? Well, I guess they that that's something that they, they would have had forever, right? Yes. And then now it's just become irritable. Well, I, I assume so. I mean, what about heel spurs? The people don't have them forever, do they? I'm just trying to think of the last well, I mean, X-ray like I saw of it. They for a, a while. A while, yeah. Before they became symptomatic. Yeah. So, Therefore, is mm. it is it really that that's contrib- like causing their pain, or is it something else, and that's a factor? Yeah, well, I mean, it correlated to all the all clinical symptoms were positive but for the posterior the, ankle. The bone is not causing it to be painful, so is it just the inflammatory or the chemical reaction happening around it? Yeah, but I, I think that would be more unlikely because it would be more unlikely. What am I trying to say? Just need to squirt some cortisone in there. Yeah, I've seen it do really well in adults with, with cortisone, but the like yes, it would it's not the bone, let's say, it's not the bone that's causing the pain, but it's involved in driving the other reactions, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. So if it wasn't there, it wouldn't say I wouldn't say there's all that inflammatory and chemical or, or whatever you're saying. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But again, when it gets better, it's probably still gonna be there. It definitely will still be there. Mm. But uh, yeah, have you seen it in adults? Have you seen it? Yeah, I've got, I had a patient recently who had it removed because they were having a bunch of other things happening around their ankle surgery wise, and yeah. that got removed as was it sore? part of it. Not sure. Could you know the I size didn't see of it before the operation? Mm. No, today. Yeah, I find the X rays. This person had had some imaging. The imaging when it comes to kids, because you've got the, the kids don't really care what the images look like. I just say it looks like a funny, fuzzy TV. Yeah. But the the parent dynamic, they really do, which is, of course, you can't blame them. You know, the person they love the most in their life would do anything for. You know, the the conversation around imaging is different to then if you're explaining it one-on-one with, with someone that's over the age of 18 or, or an adult. Mm-hmm. Have you have you ever gone through imaging with a, a mum and a dad or a carer mm-hmm. or anything like that? Not really. Not that I can think of that's, yeah. in, that's worth memory. Mem- memory? Remembering. Memory. Remembering. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I just found that I was a lot, probably like more teeth threatening and trying to, every time I would say something like, yeah, it does say this, but they're I doing... I have that many symptomatic uh, sorry, like if I sent for a, an X-ray or some sort of imaging, I don't feel like I've seen that many that have come back like badly pathological. And if I have, then I've probably referred on to a sports doctor. Yeah, I just find just explaining it, saying something with the imaging that come back in the report or what's this, and they point at that and say, yeah, like that is there. Certainly, it's very likely been there for a long time. We can see it's on the other side as well, and that's not sore. Plus, they're doing all these things, so it tells us that it's not something to be too concerned of, but just mm-hmm. continuing to reinforce it, that it's normal. Yeah, 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 I think that's important. All right, lovely listeners, enjoy this episode, and we'll speak to you all next week. Welcome back, sports medicine listeners. Now, very excited. We uh, we have a very, very special guest from very far away. Uh, he is, and he'll correct me if I'm wrong, he's currently over in the state in Chicago at the moment, and he's uh, in transit, so he's making a lot of time for this podcast, and he's going to be pretty keen to, to get into his thoughts and questions and, and learn about what he does. But I'll let him introduce himself and kind of explain where he is. But wait, thank you so much for coming on. 
Hello, my name is uh, Jorge Chala. I, uh, I'm an orthopedic surgeon specializing in sports medicine injuries, many hip knees and shoulders. I work here in Chicago, uh, Illinois, and uh, the United States at Rush uh, University Medical Center, Midwest Orthopedics at Rush. Um, I specialize mostly in sports uh, conditions, and uh, I'm a prolific researcher. I have, uh, have um, a special interest in researching joint preservation techniques, cartilage techniques, and multiligament and complex knee injuries. And um, we have a, a great group of researchers here at Rush that, that help us achieve uh, you know, a, a certain number of papers a year that, that we're very proud of. And um, we take care of professional teams here, the Chicago Fire, the Chicago White Sox, as well as the Chicago Bulls and the Joffrey Ballet. So thank you very much for uh, having me today. And it's a, it's a pleasure to be sharing some time with you guys. Yeah, that, that's awesome. We are just speaking off air. I was, I was just saying the last several years, you must have been pretty busy because you've got over, over 250 publications and written something over 30 book chapters, plus all your other credentials. You've, you've certainly been quite busy with getting things done. Yeah, it's um, it's been a great couple of years. You know, I come from Argentina, and um, you know, in Argentina, it's a little bit more difficult to do research because the resources are just not as, um, you know, not as available to everyone all the time. And uh, uh, when you come here, you have all these resources, you know, statisticians, uh, tables, and software. We use a software called Patient IQ that now can allow you to track data real time and potentially predict how comes on, on your own population based on your own outcomes things of that nature facilitate um you know the research and, and being able to to get more data and get more granular with data and be able to understand uh you know who to operate on you know what better indications are for this certain type of pathology and then we have um labs that rush as well you know biomotion labs but mechanical labs that allow us to see at time zero what can happen with different types of reconstructions fixation methods and so forth so it makes it really interesting for us to to continue to ask ourselves questions and, and potentially try to move the field forward. Yeah. So I wanted to ask the two two parts of this this question so listeners can have some context. What's the the typical training to become a, an orthopedic in the States? You mentioned from Argentina, and and a follow up to that would be now that that you're you're practicing. What does an average kind of week or couple of weeks look like in your life between? You know, clinical staff and surgery and looking after the, the teams? Well, when you come to the States, you have, it depends on the state that, that you live in, but for the most part, you have to have three years of accredited uh, education. So that means that if you've done residency uh, elsewhere, then you have to either go back to do residency or you can do multiple fellowships that are accredited. Once you've done that, then um, you have to get a medical license from the state that you want to practice on. And then after a certain number of years, you can sit down for uh, boards. That's basically the path to become an orthopedic surgeon here in the States. Yeah. In my clinical practice, I, you know, although we are affiliated with an academic institution, we're a private practice. So I don't have uh, admin days or anything like that. I just uh, pretty much do um, research on the side, if you will, right? On Saturdays and Sundays and at nights. Mm -hmm. And I have uh, five days of clinical practice. I usually operate between two to three times a week. And then have clinics the other the other two or three times a week. Yeah, uh, but it's it's mainly a clinical practice, and we do research on the side. Clearly, you know the machine of research here in our institution allows us to be uh, perfect. You know, be a little bit more efficient when we do research, and, and you know we can get more things done just because of the resources and, and really good people and scientists that we have that help us get this move uh, this project moving along. Yeah. And so with, with the teams, the the team physician role, because I'm assuming it's probably going to be a little bit different to Australia. What is, does that involve? Are you, like, is that surgical consults or kind of sports physician, sports doctor looking after injuries and kind of triaging? What does that involve? So for the most part, uh, it's uh, covering the games of, of the teams here. Basically, uh, you know, we would go to the Bulls and the White Sox games and uh, we sit we have an office. It's a little bit different than, than it is, at least in Argentina. I don't know in Australia, but I, I believe it's similar to Argentina. Yeah. But they have a, they have somebody or, or a person here called an athletic trainer, which is a person that travels with the team and, and is usually the first person that goes into the court if something would be to happen. Yeah. And uh, they evaluate, and if they need us, they will call us. But for the most part, they will take the players back to the room where we have x-rays and uh, we have uh, beds that we can examine patients on. 
So it actually makes it very comfortable for the patient as well because they're in a more private environment and they yeah. can get x-rays on site. Um, and then we have surgical consults when, when the players, you know, the players have uh, full freedom to be, to be able to have surgery wherever they want to. So uh, whenever uh, players want to have surgery with us, they can consult with us and, and uh, it just makes it for a fun, fun uh, activity for us to do. It's, it's great to see these players perform at their higher, highest level of activity, even though, you know, their joints sometimes don't look uh, phenomenal, right? They're not perfect, but they still perform at a very, very high level. So it's, it's great to see and interact with them. I think it's a, it's a pretty fulfilling uh, portion of our practice. Yeah, it, I imagine it, it would be. I mean, these are some of the, the biggest teams in in the world. It's funny, over here in Australia, we had the, well, I can't, I'm in Newcastle, which is two hours north of, of Sydney, and we've got the NRL and, like, the Newcastle Knights, and it's probably just a blip on the radar compared to some of the, the bigger teams in the States, like the NBA and, and things like that. I, I wanted to, to ask your opinion. In, in Australia at, at the moment, we have a pretty high rate of, of ACL ruptures and, and re-ruptures. Do you see them quite a lot over there? I do. Uh, you know, there seems to be a, an epidemic of, or pandemic, I would say, of ACL ruptures, mostly in the female athletes. Mm. You know, soccer has been uh, on the uprise here in the States, and, um, you know, we are seeing more and more, more and more of ACL injuries. You know, the, it's it's hard to quantify, but, you know, based on, on some data, they say that it's probably around 200,000 ACLs a year they could operate on here in the United States. So it's, it's a fairly high number that that gives that health system a, a pretty big uh, weight, I would say, and in, in how much it, you have to account for on an acute basis, but also on a chronic basis, right? Because you have to remember that ACL injuries will ultimately lead to some more arthritis than if you wouldn't have had an ACL. And those changes in uh, the burden on the, on the health system can be quite significant. You know, there's been programs that have been published in the past that have been deemed to be successful, such as the FIFA 11 plus, yeah, uh, which I think should be the mainstream for us to to continue to work on preventing these injuries. Yeah, it, it's difficult in those in those unpredictable sports. I mean, I was just at a at a women's football conference on the weekend. They were talking about ACL injuries and some of the contributing factors. You know, sports specialization it, it's turned professional so much quicker than probably what men's sport did. So the adaption and, and kind of the the people coming through. Can you can you speak to any any reasons that, that you think it, it is so much higher? I mean, it's certainly multifaceted, but any that, that you see that are, are quite common trends? Well, I think um, even amateur sports are becoming more and more professional now, right? So speed, the, the, the weights, the, the forces, the acceleration, all those things are, coming, are becoming higher and higher and higher. You know, but you have uh, non-professional teams play at the same level of professional teams these days, and I think that's one of the reasons why I, you know, I think a lot of people are more conscious about, uh, you know, health and sports and, and being active. So I think we have more and more people practicing sports. And I think there's something to be said about the pandemic and, and you know, people that have been deconditioned going back to sports can be uh, placed in a higher risk than, than other people that have been, you know, more active throughout this time. So I think there's, uh, as you said before, multiple reasons for this, but I guess that's just a few of them to mention a, a couple. Yeah, and I, I, over there, I, I've seen your your social media is a is a wealth of knowledge. I've seen a couple of posts where you've spoken about uh, like ACL ruptures and graphs and things like that. I mean, what what are you doing specifically, and what have you kind of seen as a as a common thread people doing for ACL ruptures? Generally speaking, I know that they're, they're all different on an individual case, and kind of where do you see the future of those repairs going? I think that um, it, it's evolving quite rapidly. Um, you know, we know that there's, uh, from the Norwegian and the Danish registry, we know that there's some people that can cope without an ACL. You know, the ACL is a, it's a ligament that controls a translation of the, of the tibia forward and backwards, but it also controls rotation, which is the most important factor because our brains can detect even very little amounts of rotation and perceive that as being unstable, right? So that's why... People, you know, you'll never hear anybody complain when they have an ACL tear that their shin bone moves forward too much, right? Yes. They always complain about rotational instability. So, um, you know, for some reason, there seems to be 
people that can cope with an ACL tear and others that can't. For the ones that can't, I think surgery is a good option. Um, you know, the mainstream of surgery is usually an ACL reconstruction that can be done with multiple grafts. Um, I guess the, the, the hamstrings that were uh, pretty popular, um, you know, probably 10 or 15 years ago now are being replaced uh, for quite a substantial grafts, although, you know, all of, of the autographs are, are good options. I think it's just, it doesn't matter what you do as long as you do a good technique that you know well. Um, I personally use bone tendon bone autograft. You know, it's it's different in the states than in other parts of the world. You know, I know that most people, potentially in Australia, continue to use uh, soft tissue grafts, but I think it's just a matter of what you learned, uh, what you feel comfortable with, and what your population is. Yeah, and do you do you see the future of of these grafts like getting better? Like, and you've seen it in, in your practice evolve and continue to become better. And I guess the way would the way I'm assuming what better is, is the three rupture rates being lower, which is always multifaceted as well. But do you find that they're becoming less? Yeah, you know, there's there's a couple of things that, that we've seen uh, new in the ACL world. One is the ACL repair, which means trying to preserve your own native tissue. And uh, although with a higher failure rate, I think we're still trying to find who would be the perfect candidate because there may be some uh, benefits of uh, repairing your own ACL, such as uh, keeping your own proprioception, potentially uh, delaying or avoiding um, osteoarthritis because you can potentially do a more anatomic repair. But uh, certainly it's been shown to be more, um, you know, have a higher failure of rate. So I think it's it's just a matter of identifying what's the set of people that would benefit from this in the future, if there's anything that we can do better than what we've done. A second thing is, uh, you know, something called uh, the anterolateral complex, which are a series of structures on the outside portion of your knee that we have seen that if you reconstruct them as well at the time of an ACL reconstruction, you can diminish, at least for soft tissue grafts, almost four times the retail rates in a high-risk uh, population. This is based on the stability study by Alan Gregwood. Yeah. And then understanding other factors such as, you know, we know that uh, performing a meniscectomy or a subtotal meniscectomy in the setting of an ACL reconstruction can lead that patient to having a really bad outcome or a retail rate. Understanding the slope of the tibia, which is, um, you know, the, the shape of the uh, of the shin bone on top. And if there's a, a fairly uh, increased slope, then those people are at a high risk of having a retail. So I, I think, you know, I don't know if, if we're doing an ACL reconstruction better or with better techniques, but I think we're understanding the factors that lead to failure more to potentially try to address those at the time of surgery or before so that we can be more successful. Yeah. And do you, have you, you, you guys over, over there, did you, or have you read the, the cross racing protocol that come from, from Tom Cross here in Sydney, Australia? No, I have not. Uh, yeah, it was a, it was a study that, that he had done talking, uh, and I'll briefly touch on it. We've spoken about it before on the podcast, but basically bracing someone at, at a, a certain degree, non-weight bearing and crutches for four weeks and then gradually bring them out. And he had, had published a study showing that, that ACLs can can heal. They have to be under the uh, management of a sports physician or surgeon with prophylactic drugs and things like that. But uh, it had showed some some ACLs can, can heal and they're trying to quantify that based off of MRIs. Have, have you heard of anything like that or seen anything like that in, in patients where they've just kind of magically healed? Yeah, I wouldn't say it's magic, but, uh, you know, this has been published. Um, and there's uh, there's a big series, well, I wouldn't say big, but at least uh, 10 patients from the Italian hospital in Buenos Aires where they showed uh, native healing uh, of the ACL. So that's certainly something that can happen. And and to my point before, maybe some of those scopers, quote unquote, that we discussed before from the uh, Scandinavian registries may have to do with some potential or partial healing of, of the ACL. Um, you know, I, I think we know more about uh, surgical outcomes than we do about non-surgical, uh, um, you know, uh, outcomes of ACL. But I think it's a it's a very interesting world and. That we may potential, we have a potential to harness based on the new biological therapies that we've been discussing and, and, and been exposing for other reasons, right? So maybe you know the use of PRP or uh, bone marrow aspirate uh, concentrate and things of that nature may play a role in in, in the healing of, of these injuries. Of course, it, it depends on multiple things, right? But uh, 
but a simple partial tear of an ACL has a much higher rate of healing than, than a full thickness blown out ACL. So uh, maybe we, we need to just get more granular and say, okay, based on, on the injury that you have right now and based on your stability right now and based on your age and so forth, the chances of you healing this is whatever much, right? Yeah. And now with AI and, and all these things that, that we're discovering, I think it will be much easier for us to, to start to understand who would be the people that would benefit either from non-surgical treatment to a repair versus a reconstruction. Yeah. Now, we, we had a couple of, of listener questions come through. Well, when I say a couple, we had lots of listener questions come through, so I've had to try and limit it. And this came in from, from a physio talking about ACL ruptures. They said osteochondral lesions can happen with ACL ruptures. We have seen tibial osteotomies perform to shift the weight bearing status more medially to offload the osteochondral lesion, but rehab after this can be slow and, and often really painful. The two questions are, is that a technique that you use and what would be your typical management for femoral osteochondral lesions and what is the long-term prognosis of a patient with one of these, both with and without a, a tibial osteotomy? That's a great question. I would say that we commonly see chondral injuries at the setting in the setting of an ACL injury. That being said, most of them uh, do not require surgery or do not require uh, addressing those because they're small and, and usually if you leave them alone, they'll be uh, asymptomatic. In a revision setting, when you've had an ACL that has failed already, you have to correct for all the mechanical factors. Mm. So if you have a, an increased tibial slope, then we do an anterior closing wedge osteotomy to try to bring it back down to a more normal level. If you have varus, which means that you're bow-legged, then you do a, a high tibial osteotomy in most cases, although you can do it in the femur as well, uh, to be able to open up that and, and create a, a more aligned coronal alignment uh, that will be you know, in benefit of, of, of that ACL. Now, of course, you want to offload whatever cartilage treatment you do. So if you have uh, valgus deformity, you have, you know, a lateral femoral condyle injury, then you would do a distal femoral osteotomy to try to change the load to the opposite side to protect your repair mm. or your transplant. But yeah, I think it's a, it's a great operation. I don't think it needs to be that painful. Usually, I would say that based on, on what we do and, and the blocks that we perform before surgery, it's very well tolerated. But it wouldn't do it in the primary ACL unless there's something outrageous. But for the most part, we do it in new revision settings. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I wanted to, to ask your opinion on, and you're saying, you know, specifically focusing on on knee and, and hip. Do you do you work with many foot and ankle surgeons or orthopedic uh, surgeons or see much foot and ankle surgery? Yeah, we have a, a full foot and ankle team. There's uh, four surgeons. That we actually you know, send people to in the states is very compartmentalized so we we each do a very very small portion which uh which is great because you can get uh, um you know very granular and, and you're updated on, on a very small portion of medicine but at the same time you don't have that holistic approach i would guess but uh we work uh, very closely with them and consult with with uh cases with them and i think makes it for a for a very collegial practice yeah. What what have you seen and, and even with the with the elite sporting teams for, for syndesmosis repair options, do, do people generally use like a screw or tightrope or, or something else? And, and what kind of outcomes do you see with them? Or sorry, um, have, you, have I, you heard from them working with other you teams? Know, most of them use uh, suspensory devices like the tie rope. Yeah. Um, you know, I think it's a uh, dealer's choice, to be honest with you. But um, as long as it's the same thing for the ACL, for any surgical technique, you know, I would say that whatever works in your hands and, and you're used to doing is probably what you should do. But I think for the most part, based on the fact that you don't have to uh, do a second surgery to remove the screws, suspensory, de the suspensory devices have seen a, a significant uh, increase over the last few years. Yeah, 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 interesting. I think that's pretty, pretty similar over here in, in Australia. For the bone stress injuries that you like, do you see any bone stress injuries come come in to to the clinic or people getting getting your opinion? Yeah, it's uh, very common. You know, we see it quite often when they start to prepare for the Chicago Marathon here. Ah, uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> their marriage, and it's quite common to see 
Um, and it, it's usually the same story, right? You have somebody that's been keeping their mileage uh, somewhat steady, and then all of a sudden they start to increase it quite a bit. Uh, and or, you know, they've never run or never done anything, uh, you know, with this type of endurance. And then as soon as they increase, they start feeling this uh, significant pain. Usually in, in, in the tibia, you get an MRI, you see the signal, right? So it's it's fairly common to see, um, to hear, and it's usually seasonal based on, on where the, or when the marathon is uh, going to happen, you see an uptake on those patients. Yeah, you guys over there have, have such a good marathon. We we have our Sydney marathon in, in three and a half weeks. And my, my co-host, who's a, a physio, uh, she couldn't make it tonight. She uh, unfortunately has a, a femoral bone stress injury, but very similar, big marathon coming up, doing lots of training, and then, yeah, just that, that imbalance and training load. How, how are you managing them? managing them in the like the the active sporting population compared to the non uh, population like the non-sporting population are you just completely resting them going into a boot if it's the tibia if they've got a stress fracture compared to a reaction or you're going completely non-weight bearing i usually go completely non-weight bearing but uh, i you know sometimes you see this not acutely right sometimes they say well um i've got uh, this massive pain four weeks ago and now I start running, I'm just walking, and the pain has decreased. So at that point, it doesn't make a lot of sense to give them another six weeks non weight bearing. So I think it depends on the pain. I tell them you have to aim to, to be pain-free, completely pain-free. So whatever you do, if it causes pain, then you should stop. Pain, in this case, uh, scenario is not good. It's not like in the gym where you say no pain, no gain, right? Like any pain in this setting can cause that uh, stress fracture to continue to grow and potentially develop into a full fracture, which is a disaster. But the safest thing to do if you do it is if you see it in the acute setting is, um, you know, to just offload them for six weeks with crutches and then uh, progressively let him, letting them go back. And then if he continues to come back and if he continues to be recurrent and recalcitrant, then uh, potentially surgery can be a, an option. But uh, I would say that uh, less than 5% or less than 2% end up with surgery from these cases.